I spent four months working on my cosplay of the 2023 Snow Miku, and today I'm gonna show you how I got through all of the impossibilities of its garments. I'm gonna tell you the legacy of Snow Miku and try to make this cosplay sturdy enough that it doesn't fall apart when I dance in it at the end of December. But first, I gotta pay for a very expensive cosplay, so let's thank today's sponsor, Skillshare. The foundation of everything I do on this channel is my passion for graphic design. And if you want to go from ironically using Comic Sans to a genuine appreciation of Helvetica, Skillshare can help you learn everything you need to know about design in your own time. Skillshare's got a learning path on graphic design basics and it'll teach you everything from industry standard programs like Illustrator and Photoshop and walk you through basic design projects like logos and posters. And if graphic design is your passion, Skillshare can also help you make it a new career path. They can take you through the basics of making a great portfolio and give you all the skills you need to make that passion a paycheck. I've been looking at this class called Build Your Dream Business by Isis Brianna, because believe it or not, this channel is a business. And with my art degree, I have no idea what I'm doing. But Isis is gonna take me from my current state of saving all of my money for fear of when the tax man comes to being a non-gaslighting, non-gatekeeping girl boss. And if you wanna be a girl boss or a boy boss or a non-binary boss, then make sure you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description because the first 500 people to click that link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So check out that link while I break down the ridiculous elements of this cosplay. This thing's got a hidden hoop skirt, complicated curved satin stitching, beautiful bobbles, bountiful bows, bewildering blues, over a hundred scallops and an unbelievable amount of parachute clips. So buckle up and let's look at the design. Isaki TM, the artist who designed this Miku was kind enough to release to the world a reference sheet of all the layers of this cosplay. Bottommost layer being a big fluffy snowball skirt. My plan was to do this skirt with a hidden hoop skirt like I did for my Kanzuki Renko cosplay years prior, but I'm gonna save you all this stuff about the hoop skirt because it's boring, you can buy one, and the hoop skirt itself has nothing to do with how you hide it. So let's start with how I'm gonna hide a hoop skirt. The way I've done this before is essentially to make a regular skirt with a built-in petticoat that then attaches to a bottom cover. The bottom cover then wraps around the bottom of the hoop skirt, hiding the whole thing. The bottom layer can be as simple as a single layer of fabric, but I made it way more complicated than it needed to be. For the inside cover, I have a very gathered white half circle skirt. On top of that, I have had this beautiful iridescent pink organza in my stash for a little bit, but I had just enough to get me some strips that I can ruffle up and then put on top of the white fabric. But I then wanna cover that so it's a little more subtle with some tool. This is actually just like tool that I have folded over and then at the fold, I stitched it down. I haven't even trimmed this up to the length of the skirt yet. I'll do it later, but uh, tool's a pain in the ass to work with. So I just wanted it to be as easy as possible. But yeah, it's gonna be like, huh, huh. Huh. You see that iridescent, but it's still like a little subtle. It'll be a little more loud once that fabric is gathered, but I think it's gonna be really pretty. By the way, I already surged every single edge of this organza because I'm warning you right now, if you ever wanna work with a fabric like this, like, yes, it's very pretty. It's a pain in the ass. It's such a pain in the ass. It is like the most pain in the ass fabric I've maybe ever worked with. It is worse than chiffon. Okay, tool might be worse but it's pretty bad. Actually, I take that back. This is worse than tool if you don't have a serger. If you have a serger, this is fine. If you don't have a serger, I honestly don't recommend working with this unless you're willing to suffer immensely because it, it just, it frays really, 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 really bad. But I have a beautiful air threader serger from Bernina that you can check out an affiliate link in the description for. Basically what I need to do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna gather these up and then I'm gonna sew those onto my white layer. Organza is gonna get sewn onto the white. The tool's gonna get sewn on top of that. I'm gonna trim everything up, serge everything, top stitch them all together so they're all nice and neat. And then I'm gonna give the whole thing a waistband as if it was just a regular skirt. But once I have that, I will not be able to do anything with it until I have fabric for the outside skirt. So I finally have my fabric for the snowball skirt and I have a general idea of 
how a skirt like this is constructed, but I've been a little lost on like how I want to execute it. This skirt is basically a bubble skirt, but they're basically a skirt that is gathered at the top and gathered at the hem. And in this case, I'm doing a circle skirt that's gathered at the top and at the hem. But the problem with this one, the gathers are like really big and irregular. I don't know how good the fabric I got is gonna look that way. I'll show you the fabric I got. I decided to do this in Sherpa, but if I just gathered this at the top and the bottom and put it over the hoop skirt, you would see the hoop skirt right through it. So I have created the weirdest petticoat that anyone has ever seen. So what this is, the very bottom is just a plain cotton circle skirt. Then what I did was I gathered up a bunch of stiff net and I sewed the stiff net around the top of the cotton skirt. And then I gathered the bottom of the stiff net, which also important to note was a little bit longer than the cotton skirt and gathered the bottom of the stiff net to the bottom of the cotton skirt. Then I did two layers of tulle which I did not attach at the top yet for a very specific reason uh, and only attached at the bottom. So now I have one layer of cotton, one layer of stiff net and two layers of regular tulle. The cotton skirt is also the skirt that I plan to gather down the Sherpa onto. The Sherpa is also a little bit longer than the cotton skirt, which means what it's gonna do is it's gonna drape down and come up, creating that puffy thing that we want. Uh, but before I do that, this cosplay needs pockets, so we're gonna put pockets in the Sherpa, which I don't know if that's a good idea because there's two skirts that go above this, but I don't think I'd be able to put pockets in either of those. And I'm gonna do these pockets the same way I did them for my Sakizo ball gown. And I don't think they have like an official name, but they're basically giant 18th century style pockets that are sewn into the garment, but done the way you do a zippered pocket, but without the zipper. I'm gonna lay one side of my pocket piece on to where I want the pocket to go on the Sherpa on the right side, so the fuzzy side. I'm gonna sew a little rectangle in the center of that pocket. When I get that in, I'm gonna cut down the center line, shove that side of the pocket onto the other side of the fabric, and then take my other pocket piece, put that onto the other pocket piece, and then sew around those. And now I have a giant pocket with a giant pocket slit and it's amazing. So now that I've put the pockets in, I can no longer avoid doing the gathering, which I'm just avoiding because I don't know if it's gonna look good. So I'm gonna gather this first and I'm gonna see if I like it. If I don't like it, I'm gonna rip out the gathering stitches and figure something else out. But because I want the option to be able to rip out the gathering stitches, I'm gonna gather it down by hand. Okay, so when I went to put this on, uh, one of the gathering stitches snapped on this side uh, so that makes me realize that I probably need to gather this down with an elastic channel instead. And I did go ahead and throw the mock-up I have for one of the side skirts on there just so I can sort of get an idea of how it's looking. And I don't love it, but I guess it's fine. But this is, this poof factor here is not just the petticoat that I already showed you. I also shove a bunch of like balled up tool into some random places. So that is why I left this tool unattached to the top yet. Cause what I'm gonna do is use that tool as another pocket and shove a bunch more tool into it. That way I end up with these like extra roundy poofies that are a little more irregular. Uh, but for now, this needs an elastic channel instead of the gathering stitches I did. So I am gonna have to rip all of these out. But for the elastic channel, basically all I'm gonna do is sew some bias tape onto the wrong side of the fabric, just sew all the way around it on both sides and then stick some elastic in there, which I get to do with a newfangled sewing instrument that I have called a bodkin, which is basically just this big needle thing, but it has a ball on the end of it. And you can put the elastic in that and then shove that through the channel. And it's so much easier. Uh, if you don't have that, you can always do the thing where you put a safety pin on the end of the elastic and shove it through the channel, but that takes a lot longer. And uh, if the safety pin opens at some point, you are screwed. All right, so when I got the elastic on there, I got it on the dress form and it did go over the hoop skirt, woo. But then I realized that I needed to then take the elastic out because it needs to be attached to all the other petticoats first 
and then have the elastic fed through because in order for all of the layers to go over the hoop skirt, all of the layers need to be sewn together and then have the elastic fed through them because if not, one layer might be too tight to go around the hoop skirt. Anyway, so I took the elastic out, but also, I also realized that the Sherpa layer also needs a zipper. And for some reason, I decided it was time to make a deal with the devil and do an invisible zipper in Sherpa. I don't know why, especially when the other skirts cover this up, but I guess the idea that if they flop up, I don't want you to see the zipper. Anyway, I did an invisible zipper. So I used my invisible zipper foot, which is very different than a regular zipper foot. The difference is that this one has little grooves in it. An important thing though, is when you do an invisible zipper, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take the zipper and iron it. So you're like pressing the zipper teeth away from the zipper tape so that it opens up a little more so that you can get even closer to the zipper teeth. I just put one side of that on one side of a new cut that I put into the Sherpa skirt, took that over to the machine, took forever lining it up because the Sherpa did not want to really go where I wanted it to go. And you got to get the front and the back of that zipper lined up into that groove. Uh, but once it is, I just made sure my needle was going where it needed to go and I just sewed. And the invisible zipper foot makes it really easy to get really close to those teeth. And then I lined up the other side, did all of that again. And I have the worst installed invisible zipper I think I have ever done. I have no idea how it ended up so uneven at the top, but it's fine. It's going into a waistband anyway. And uh, as you'd imagine, the invisible zipper sure did like to get stuck in the Sherpa pile. Uh, so I did cut out some of the Sherpa pile that was around the zipper and that did help a little bit. Anyway, with the zipper installed, I'll finally tell you how all of these stupid layers go together to make a single skirt. The first thing was to attach the Sherpa layer to its personal petticoat. That one got sewed right side to wrong side of the Sherpa. So it's underneath the Sherpa layer. Pin that around the bottom. And again, because the Sherpa is a little bit longer than that piece, I did have to scrunch the Sherpa up in a couple places. But once that was sewn all the way around the hem of the Sherpa layer, then it was time to sew that right sides together with the bottom cover of the hoop skirt. So I sewed that right sides together with the Sherpa all the way around the edges. And then I turned all that inside out, put the elastic back into the channel. And now I have this weird blob. The only thing left for this is the waistband and the attachments to attach the waistbands together. But I will go ahead and show you how the hoop skirt fits into this. I have to flip this over to the other side. I'm gonna take it and this is, this is quite the struggle, but basically this goes in here, right? So then this part gets pulled up through here and this part still needs a waistband. So I can't like connect these yet, but just to show you, Bottom of the skirt, hoop skirt's totally hidden. Top of the skirt, hoop skirt's totally hidden. Now I just need to do the attachments and this waistband. Once that waistband is on, I then have to create my mechanism to connect the waistbands together. Originally I thought I was gonna do buttons, but I actually think what I'm gonna do is just a bunch of little straps with parachute buckles because honestly that sounds more reliable than buttons. So the last time I worked on the actual cosplay was September 1st and we are now midway through October. Long story short, half of my fabric order got held hostage in online fabric stores back order hell. It wasn't actually even going to come until the end of November and it wasn't until a series of emails that I got them to send me some other fabrics. But now I finally have all my fabrics and I have cut out basically all the pieces that I need so I can finally start working on the cosplay. But first, I wanna tell you a little bit about kimono. Obviously this cosplay is not a traditional kimono in any sense, but parts of it are inspired by a real life thing worn by real life people. So I wanna talk about what things are inspired by actual kimono and what things aren't. Originally, the word kimono just meant thing to wear, but eventually it started to refer to a traditional style of Japanese clothing made with large blocky cuts of fabric. And they usually don't have sizes because kimono are fitted by wrapping it around your body and then tying it and folding it and tucking it and carefully placing it to get the perfect straight line fit. That's like a big thing, is it supposed to be straight? The upper half of this cosplay with its multiple collars, the hanging sleeves and the wide belt 
all call back to that traditional silhouette. But the bottom half is not like it at all. Because remember, kimono is supposed to be straight, so there wouldn't be a big puffy skirt. The big puffy skirt, though, does sort of indicate that this is more inspired by Wa Lolita, which, as you can imagine, is a subset of Lolita fashion inspired by traditional Japanese fashion, which I think is so fun because Lolita is a Japanese fashion inspired by Western fashion, and then Wa Lolita is Western to Japanese to then double down on the Japanese, but including some of the Western stuff with the big puffy skirt. I just think that's fun. It's a just mix of so many things. Anyway, to understand what's going on with all those layers, I did a whole bunch of research on what layers are normally worn with kimono. And looking at Isaki's reference sheet, Miku has some fun fluffy underwear, but if we ignore that and look at that white collar, that in traditional kimono is something called kimono underwear. That's the only thing I saw that it was called, but that's traditionally a plain white layer that is sometimes sleeveless and sometimes it has sleeves. But then what goes on top of that is I think called a juban. That's what the pink collar is. A juban is almost like a whole kimono that you wear under the kimono. It being different than the underwear in that it always has full length sleeves. And looking at the reference, that's exactly what the pink layer has. And because Miku is wearing both the underwear layer and the juban, it indicates that this is supposed to be special event wear or formal wear, as opposed to something like a yukata, which is worn to more casual events like summer festivals and is not typically worn with the underwear or a juban. Yukata are also usually cotton because they're worn in the summer and cotton is nice and cool. Whereas like formal kimono or normally made of like silk, though nowadays there's plenty of polyester ones. But the outermost layer is where it starts to get like weird and cosplay -y. The navy blue thing. I tried to look up if there's any kind of traditional Japanese garment that looks anything like that, and I was not able to find anything. Hayoris are a thing, but they don't ever look like that. We're gonna chalk that up to artistic interpretation. So I don't have a traditional historical reference for the navy blue thing, but then the other part of it is that in the reference, the navy blue coat thing is also attached to the lighter blue kimono sleeves. So I'm gonna call that whole thing the actual kimono because it's our outermost layer. It's all one piece in the reference sheet and I'm gonna create it as all one piece. Also, I'm not trying to say in any sense that I'm gonna make this cosplay as traditional as I possibly can. I can't, it's, it's not a traditional shaped kimono. But I wanted to know as much as I could about what it's inspired by because how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And relevant tangent, when I was in elementary school, we had this one teacher who was of Japanese descent and every year she would have her mom come to her class and her mom was like born in Japan. And when her mom came, she would bring kimono and she would talk to us about them. She would let us touch them. And she even let some of the kids wear them. And I got to be one of those kids. I was in like third grade and I still vividly remember this woman carefully tying and tucking and putting this garment on me and how it was like the first time in memory that I put on something and it felt special. Like the fabric felt special. The way it was made felt special. It felt like it was made with love and care and then it was put on me with love and care. And it stuck with me enough that I still remember it and I don't remember why I walked into the kitchen most of the time. And I tell you this story because my goal for the cosplay is to be able to put one ounce of how special those garments felt into my own cosplay. Anyway, I already whipped through making that plain white underlayer, so let's move on to making our pink juban. So the fabric I have for this part is a pink polyester charmeuse. Uh, and obviously my pattern is not super traditional, but get used to seeing it because I have to use the same pattern for both the juban and the actual kimono. This one is not gonna be lined and the kimono is gonna be lined. And because I'm not lining this one, I needed to get rid of all my raw edges. So I went ahead and I surged all of my pieces. But what I have on the table right now is two back pieces, two front pieces, and four sleeve pieces, because there's two sleeve pieces per sleeve. The construction of this is also 
really simple, but I am gonna do something a little bit differently to make it easier to put the sleeves on. So I'm gonna start by taking my back pieces, sewing the back seam together. Once I have that, instead of sewing the side seams together, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my front pieces and sew them to the back pieces only at the shoulder seams. That way, my side seams are still open, which is what's gonna make it really easy to put the sleeves on. Uh, but first I gotta sew my two sleeve pieces and make them one sleeve piece. And right now, all I'm gonna do is sew them across the top so that the two become one. And so now what I can do is I can take my front and back pieces, I can lay them out flat and sew the sleeves onto the arm's eye while the whole thing is still flat, which means I don't have to go round and round on the machine, which is great. But it's also important because the other thing with kimono, and I don't super know the specifics or how big these are supposed to be, but there's supposed to be like an opening on the bodice part under your arm. So your side seams are not supposed to be sewn together all the way. And then there's also supposed to be an opening in your sleeve. Now, traditionally, a kimono sleeve is supposed to just be a block that goes right off. It doesn't usually have this extra square part that I have on mine, but that's what Miku's looks like, so that's why I did it this way. But I do want to have an opening on the hanging part. So what I'm going to do is leave this whole part open. Leave a couple inches open on the hanging part of the sleeve and then sew the rest of that up. For the parts that I left open, they are surged and they're not gonna fray, but I don't want that surging peeking out. So what I'm gonna do is fold those edges over to the inside, press them flat, and then do a little top stitch to keep them in there. We have to do a lot more complicated stuff with the one with the lining, but for this part, that's all we gotta do. Once I get those pieces that are gonna be open pressed, I am then gonna go through Put my sleeves right sides together and I'm going to sew down the bottom of my sleeve. So all the way around my curve until I get to the part where my hand will be coming out. Uh, and this opening, honestly, all of the openings are kind of just arbitrary because I, I don't actually know how big they're supposed to be. But as long as it's big enough for my hand to get out, it's fine. <laughs> I'm really just estimating how big that's gonna be. So now I gotta do the collar. And so I have this turned right sides out and here's my collar piece. I already went ahead and ironed on the interfacing. And then I also pressed up all the edges so that now I can kind of use this the way you do bias tape. So what I'm gonna do, I've got the center marked. So I'm gonna take this part and I'm gonna put it right sides together with my center back seam. I'm just gonna pin that all the way around as far as it goes. You'll notice it doesn't go all the way down because it's not supposed to. And this is sort of an arbitrary length. It's actually probably supposed to be a little bit longer, but that's how big I made mine. But now I'm just gonna sew that on there. And I wanna sew it pretty close to that fold I put in there. So now, now that that's on, see how nice that looks? So now we can take it and let those folds do the folding thing. Repin that and then flip to the top side so I can do a really tiny top stitch. So now I have this. It looks super nice on the outside, doesn't it? Well, f me, I missed a couple spots on the inside and I don't want to do another top stitch or unpick it. So I'm just gonna sew those down by hand so that there's only one line of top stitching because that's annoying. The last thing I have to do to these, she's got these little fluffy puffy cuffs and in the layer breakdown, they are on the Juban and I do not know yet how I want to attach them. Okay, so I did manage to get the cuffs on by machine. Now we have these. Still need to go through and double fold and finish this part, but I do want to try it on. Normally kimonos just close with ties. They don't have any real closures, uh, but because this costume has to dance, I think I might end up having like hook and eyes or snaps or something. But for now, we'll do a little tie. There we go. Woo! This here is a little short, but you shouldn't see it under the other layer, so it doesn't super matter. The next thing I wanna do is talk about the color blue. So the first time I looked at this, for some reason I was convinced that that light color was lilac, but when I finally opened it up in Illustrator and like used the eyedropper tool to see what color it actually is, it's, it's blue and it's, it's a neutral blue. There's no green, there's no red. It doesn't go almost purple. There's no red in it. I don't know why I thought it was purple. The biggest problem was that there was no green. And that's a problem because in a lot of fabrics, a lot of light blues that you find, hardly any of them are like a true 
powder blue, a true periwinkle where it's just a little bit of blue. And I had a really, really hard time finding a fabric that was that really, really light blue. So I was like, okay, I'll get white cotton and we'll dye it. Cotton dyes like a dream, but then there was another problem. <laughs> My go-to dye company, RIT Dye, in their regular dye line, so not the synthetic line, they don't make like a true blue. And so I was searching and searching and searching for a blue dye that'll work on cotton that doesn't have any other color in it than blue. And finally I was like, I wonder if there's a natural dye that's just blue. And guess what? There is. This is Izome, AKA, Japanese indigo. It is a natural, only blue dye made from an indigo plant. And lucky for me, unlike other natural dyes, it's actually really easy to work with. I have not ever used it before though, so we're gonna do a dye test. So we're gonna get a bucket and we're gonna test some isome. So I have my swatches. I have a bucket of 203-ish ounces of water. And for once, I'm actually following instructions. This is not something I ever do, uh, but I don't wanna mess this up and I don't know how to do this. This sheet of paper just came with the dye when I bought it. If you wanna know more about indigo dye, I will link some other videos down below that'll be more informative than this. But basically this piece of paper is telling me that the appropriate amount of water is 10 times the weight of the fabric. Now I'm only using swatches right now, but I wanna use the same amount of water that I'm going to for the big piece of fabric. And because I have 20 ounces of fabric, I did weigh this by the way, I weighed it on my food scale by putting the fabric in a bowl. 10 times 20 ounces is 200 ounces. I have about 200 ounces right there. Uh, I want, it to be the same so that I know that the blue comes out the same. I'm gonna go ahead and pour my water into my bigger vat. And the reason why I'm not doing it directly in the bucket is because you're supposed to like massage the fabric so that the dye gets distributed evenly. Now that doesn't seem like enough water for the amount of fabric that I have. That doesn't seem, okay, we'll just do it for this test. Maybe I'm just dumb, uh, but these need to be wet. So I'm gonna get them wet. And because this is supposed to be light blue, I'm just gonna do one tablespoon. I'm supposed to shake it. Supposed to shake it. Okay. And also, because this is a natural dye, I don't need gloves. Here goes the tablespoon. Oh, that's pretty. Was it a good idea to do this on my desk? I don't know, but we're doing it. Does it say how long you're supposed to leave it? Oh, okay. You're supposed to massage it in the dye bath for one to two minutes. I'm gonna do something fun too, hold on. So the other thing indigo is used for, well, the big thing it's used for, honestly, is tie-dye. <laughs> Along with my swatches, I think I'm gonna tie-dye a shirt. I've prepared a tie-dye. I don't know if that'll look good. I just kind of tied it, but I haven't done tie-dye in a long time and I don't really care how this comes out. I just want to see the color. Okay, okay, so here we go. Swatches go in. I'm supposed to do this for two minutes. It seems like the big thing with indigo is dipping and re-dipping to get the darker colors, which is a good thing for me because I want a really light blue. On camera, this probably, I mean, does that look light blue to you? It probably just looks white still. So we might have to do more than one dip or maybe just more dye. I don't think my tie-dye is gonna come out very tie-dye. I don't think I tied it tight enough, but it definitely looks blue now and it looks consistently blue. I guess that's not what you want with a tie-dye. But the swatches look, consistent. Okay, I think it's been two minutes. So now I'm supposed to dry them and that's literally it. I might need more dye than what I used, but I will make that decision tomorrow. You like my new totally not tie-dyed, but totally definitely blue shirt? Anyway, I ended up doing a couple other dips. So I have three swatches now. This one was the one that I did on camera. So it is definitely light blue, but it is a little too light blue. So I do think we're gonna do three tablespoons of dye. So I already refilled my thingy with water. I have already soaked my giant thing of fabric. And now I just need to move my giant kitty and we can dye this fabric. I also still can't get over how cool the dye looks when you put it in the bath. Okay, giant kitty out of the way. I got all the fabric wet. We're gonna say a little prayer to the dye gods. Please indigo plant, make this the color that I want it. Okay. 
I'm gonna make a mess though. Kitty is still on the floor and she's about to get wet and I don't think she's gonna be happy about that. Okay, here we go. So we have to massage it for two minutes once I get it all in there. Set a timer for two minutes. Two minutes, counting down. Now this is where the massaging is actually gonna matter because there's a lot of fabric in here. But the good news is, I mean, it doesn't really cover the fabric. So maybe I should use more water. I think as long as I massage it or knead it. That's what the instructions say. The, the instructions say to knead it. So Kitty, would you like to help? Would you like to come make some biscuits on this? That'd probably be bad for you. But it looks blue. It's definitely looking blue. Do you kind of like the idea that it looks a little like hand dyed like the shirt does? Though I did not say what I ended up doing with the shirt was because I couldn't see. Ah! So I guess we take her out. That was so much more dramatic than I was expecting. Uh, what I didn't say was what I did with the shirt was I left it in the tub, like halfway through the tub overnight, because I was trying to get it to be like a split dye, and that didn't really work. <laughs> but hey, my shirt's blue. Again, all you're supposed to do after you dye it is dry it. Let me see. It looks pretty freaking blue to me, man. So I'm gonna throw it in the dryer with my junk towel and then I will see if I need to dip it again. She's dry. It looks really good, but compared to the reference image, it's still a little too light. So I think I'm gonna dip it again, but I do really like this color. I just think it's a little bit too light still. She's wet again. So let's dip her again. Set a two minute timer. Two minutes, counting down. Thanks Siri. Hopefully the timer doesn't scare the crap out of me again. One thing is for sure though, it is definitely only blue. So I don't know if I'm just like purple colorblind, but I swear when I look at that color, I see purple. Here's the other thing though that I wanna make clear. Color accuracy is one of the stupidest things to get really strung up on. I once did a Rosalina cosplay that I never finished because when I posted it on Instagram, everybody like bullied the shit out of me for it like not being the exact shade of bluish turquoise-ish cyan. And it's like, yo, there's only so much fabric out there. There's only so many colors out there. And if I want to make a thing to wear on my body to an anime convention, you don't need to bully me that I didn't get the color completely correct. But this blue was so hard to find that I feel like this is worth doing. This is also kind of fun. I also like just learning new stuff about dyes. But yeah, don't get hung up on color accuracy. If people bully you, them. Maybe leave this in for one more minute, maybe? Be darker, but not too dark. I didn't say this already. Uh, if you're using a natural dye, you need a natural fibered fabric. So you need a cotton, a linen, a wool, a silk, a jute. Some stuff's made out of jute, right? Bamboo? I think that's it. I think that's all the natural fibers. One of those is plants. It's an animal's fur. It's a bug's cocoon or it's leather. You don't think you can do leather with this. You done? I'm once again going to put this in the dryer again and we'll see if we need another dip. I think we might need another dip, maybe with a little more dye. This is dip two and I literally don't trust my eyes anymore. So I ended up taking a picture of it and pulling it into Illustrator and eyedropper tooling everything and honestly, depending on the light and the camera, honestly, according to Illustrator, I think this is as close as we're gonna get. I think this works. I think it's blue uh, and I will hold up a piece of the navy and I think they work really well together. And like I said, color accuracy should not be a thing that you stress out too much over because what's more important is do the colors look good together? And I think these look lovely together. After literally months of waiting for the cotton, my naturally dyed with Japanese indigo, blue fabric for my blue part of my kimono that's multiple colors of blue and gonna be multiple fabrics. But I finally have it. So now I can finally start making my actual kimono. So when I cut them out on the kitchen floor, I finally saw them in the sunlight and they looked 
really, really light, but I did go ahead and cut them out. But I wasn't past the point of no return yet, because the final question was, how did this blue look next to the white that's gonna be the snowflakes? And there, there just wasn't enough contrast. So I did take my cut pieces and I did one more dip. You can dye your cut pieces, by the way. It's just a little more risky because if you end up with any blotches or anything, you can sort of work around the blotches. Uh, but because I did this to my cut pieces, I risked getting blotches and guess what? I did, but it's fine. There's a little bit more contrast now, so the wait is over for these two to become one. It's complicated curved satin stitching time. So I'm doing this snowflake. So instead of tracing this onto this, I traced this onto this. This is heat and bond light. Heat and bond light is basically a double-sided tape for fabric that comes in a roll, so you can use it for big shapes like this, and it works really well for when you're gonna do satin stitching because it completely secures the thing you're about to satin stitch to the thing you're gonna satin stitch it to before you have to satin stitch it, which is great because satin stitching moves everything around. When you get it, it's got one side that's got sticky bubbles on it and one side that has paper on it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take it sticky side down and iron it onto the white fabric. I'm not gonna cut the snowflake out until I've got that heat and bond on there because having the heat and bond on there with its paper and all that stuff makes it a lot easier to cut out a complicated shape. Trust me, you don't wanna be trying to cut out a snowflake like this without the assistance of that paper. These also have a little sun and a little moon in the middle of the snowflakes. So I also went ahead and made my little sun and moon the same way with the heat and bond on the back. But I need to get this onto this first and then I can put this on the snowflake. So now all I gotta do is take both of these over to the iron, peel the paper backing off, which will show us the other side of that glue. Put this piece glue side down onto my sleeve and iron it on. Once that's on there, I can do the same thing to my little moon and we can get to satin stitching. Look at that! So the big thing I wanted with the snowflake is to have a different texture than the cotton and the dupioni with the dull bridal satin moon. I love it, it looks so cool. To add to all of this fun shininess, I have some special thread that I'm gonna be satin stitching this on with. I actually got some iridescent thread to do this with. Now, doing satin stitching in iridescent thread or any plasticky thread is gonna make it a little more difficult. That plastickiness is gonna mean that that thread is probably gonna be likely to snap and be pretty annoying. So it is a little bit of a risk. I do recommend that if you get an iridescent thread, you do go for a higher quality one. I have one that I bought like a year and a half ago for Ronnie. It was a little cheaper and it did straight stitches okay but it could not do a satin stitch on any of my machines without breaking. And also you should usually wind yourself a bobbin that has the same thread. So you should be using iridescent thread on the top and the bottom to help the machine's tension. I had a lot of trouble getting my Foff or my Crafter to wind a bobbin of this iridescent thread. So after doing a whole bunch of tests, I decided to do this on my grandma's machine, my Foff with iridescent thread on the top and a pink bobbin in the bottom. It just seems to be working better without the iridescent thread in the bobbin for whatever reason. And I'm also doing it on the Foff because it has a speed setting and doing satin stitching on all of these complicated curves is gonna really be pretty freaking hard to get looking good. So I need to take it slow and steady. I will be spending my whole weekend at the Foff satin stitching four snowflakes, two moons, and two sons, and hopefully they will end up looking good. Despite all of the tests I did, the Foff kept breaking the thread every like couple inches. I tried a couple things to stop that, but the big thing was I thought I could not change the tension on this machine. Uh, I could, it's just hidden within the many weird Game Boy Advanced looking menus it has. And after re-threading, like 15 times, I switched over to the crafter because I at least knew where that tension dial was. And with the tension actually turned down, it only broke the thread once or twice for the entire rest of the sleeves. And I will take that over the 15 sometimes the Foff did it on one panel. The crafter might not have all the computerized luxuries of my grandma's machine, but by God, sometimes you just need a machine where you at least know where the tension dial is. Anyway, if you don't know how to do a satin stitch, 
You might think of satin as just a shiny kind of fabric, but it's actually a weave. A weave that has long threads skipping over other threads, which is what makes it shiny. But a satin stitch is what we call any kind of stitch with long threads sitting right next to each other. In hand embroidery, you can do it at much longer lengths, but when you're doing it by machine, you're limited to the machine's max stitch width. The stitch width determines how wide those stitches are gonna be, and we can use a zigzag stitch to get a bunch of parallel ones. So then if we take our stitch length and we make it really small, they'll all actually sit right next to each other. How short you make that stitch length though is gonna depend on the fabric and it's gonna depend on your machine. On my machine, it's like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ish. And if you take it too far down, the fabric won't move anymore. So do some tests until you find the sweet spot. But Doing a zigzag stitch that close together on a lighter weight fabric can make it bunch up really bad. And to combat that, I always use tearaway interfacing under what I'm satin stitching. And that makes sure it comes out nice and neat and flat. Satin stitching is easiest with straight lines uh, and curves are kind of really difficult because what you gotta do is you gotta constantly guide the fabric into curving, which takes a lot of sewing intuition because you gotta pull back with one hand and push forward with the other perfectly in sync with the speed of your machine. And if you're doing a perfect circle, it's even more difficult, but it can be really helpful to aim for the very edge of that applique. So you know for sure where that line needs to be all the way around. Because if you stray even a little bit, it's gonna end up wonky. It's like that one moon in Mario Odyssey and Sand Kingdom, except if you mess this one up, the thing you already put work into is gonna look like a blob instead of a circle. But with my complicated curved satin stitching finished, I think it's finally time I over-explained Hatsune Miku herself. So who's Hatsune Miku? In the simplest terms, she's the mascot for a piece of software. So Vocaloid is a music production software that uses something called voice banks, which are artificial voices that you can make sing. So it's sort of like text to speech, but you can change the pitch. And it's been around since like 2004. Hatsune Miku was introduced in 2007. There were Vocaloids before her, but when she came around, she was dubbed 01 and she was immediately the number one princess of the world. All right, after Miku, we got Zero Two twins, Rin and Len, then Miku's occasional love interest, Luka, then Kaito and Maiko and Gakupo, and now there's so many Vocaloids that I don't know who most of them are. Uh, but weirdly, and I didn't know this, there's only four Vocaloids with numbers. It's one through three. It's There's two twos and one one and one three. There's only four of them that have numbers, and I don't know why. I For a long time, I think I thought everybody had a number, but they don't. Except for best girl, Tato, who is not a Vocaloid, but was almost a Vocaloid, but that's a story for a different day. Uh, but yeah, there are other voice bank softwares, some of which even also have their own idols. But yeah, nowadays there's so many Vocaloid voice banks and weirdly, I, I just think I just assumed that when you buy Vocaloid, the software, that you get Miku with it, but you don't. You get a couple of base voice banks and you have to buy Miku separately. And weirdly on the Vocaloid English website, you can't just buy Miku. But if you switch it to the Japanese website, Miku is there in several languages, including English, and I don't know why you wouldn't at least sell the English-speaking Miku on the English website, but they don't. But yeah, that's who Miku is. She's the mascot and headliner for a voice bank software. And through the years, many different producers have created iconic music through her voice. So Vocaloid, the company, is making the software, but it is individuals who are creating all of the music that the fandom knows and loves. So all of her personality, all the lyrics, they're just made up by people. And at base level, a lot of what people love about Vocaloids and Miku is the music. But there's also rhythm games like Project Diva and Colorful Stage. And it's also about cosplay and dances and art and Miku Miku Dance, which is a dance program, and I don't know if that's super popular still, but the Miku Miku dance used to be a huge thing back in the day. And I say back in the day because Miku has been popular for a long time. She was the one-time star of a Domino's pizza ad, and now she's still beloved by so many people. And as a 29-year-old who has been into this since she was 17 years old, it just warms my heart that all these teenagers think this thing is cool that I thought was really cool when I was 17 and that it's still relevant, and it makes me feel a little less old. <laughs> anyway, 
She's not just a thing living in your Wi-Fi. On August 22nd, 2009, the world got to see Miku and all of her friends perform on stage in hologram form. Though, they're not actually holograms. They're actually done with by the Pepper's ghost effect. So what it is is special pane of curved glass, and then there's a projector behind the glass, which projects them onto the glass and makes them kind of look 3D. It's like the, the Tupac hologram or the way they do the ghosts in the Haunted Mansion. It's not a real hologram. But when I was 17, holograms were real and anime girls were corporeal and I couldn't believe it. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And after being a fan of this thing for over 10 years now, how old am I? Yeah, over 10 years. Anyway, next year, I'm gonna get to see the Miku hologram at Miku Expo and I'm very excited. Anyway, I'll tell you about what Snow Miku is in a little bit. First, we gotta get back to those sleeves. So with all the satin stitching done, I went through and I added the snowflakes and the pearls to them. I did do these semi-randomly, but remember how I said I got a couple blotches from the dye? Well, I strategically placed a couple snowflakes so that they would cover up some of the blotches. They don't completely cover them all up, but hey, at least they're really pretty. And I'm pretty happy with them. But the next logical step is to take my two panels and sew them together, but I'm not actually gonna do that yet. Because basically every piece of this cosplay, every panel has some kind of detail that I need to do to it first before I can sew them all together. So I'm actually gonna move on to the upper sleeves. The fabric I have for the main part of the sleeve is this navy blue velvet. I'm actually gonna be working with two kinds of velvet for this project. You'll see the other one later. Velvet is usually a huge pain in the ass. Normal velvet is usually like pretty slippery and it's really hard to sew with because you kind of have to like hand sew everything together first before you do your actual stitch. You have to use a walking foot or it'll get all messed up and your seams will look really ugly. But because this is an upholstery velvet, it's meant for like couches and stuff. So it has like a good amount of stiffness to it. So I think I should be able to use this pretty normally, but the detail that these need is uh, kind of terrifying and not something that you can just easily look up. If you look at the reference image, these sleeves and the navy blue skirt, they don't just have scallops, they have like double scallops, inverted scallops, bound scallops. I don't really know what you would call these because this is not a thing you really see in regular clothing. You wanna know why? Because it's really hard to do. The closest thing I could find was a couple people binding quilts with scallops, but any tutorials I saw online, they weren't doing traditional scallops where it has a lump and then a point. The quilt scallops I saw were lump, inner lump, lump, inner lump. These scallops on this Miku have a lump and a point. And if you tried to do them in binding, you could. You would end up having to do a mitered corner on every single corner. Now that's not that hard to do, but getting every single mitered corner to look right and sit flat and not pucker and all face the same way would be really annoying. So I'm not gonna do that. I figured out a different way to do it on my own. And I am lovingly referring to these as inverted scallops because we basically have to invert them first to even put them on. So before I even touch the blue fabric, I have cut a very strangely shaped piece of my white fabric. This is again the white polyester dupioni. And with this, I have also done some weird to my pattern. This was the pattern. I've cut it into two pieces. You probably see where this is going. When I made the sleeve pattern, I indicated where the scallops would be, and then I also added seam allowance to where the scallops are. Cut the pattern apart right where the scallops are supposed to start. So then I just cut these white pieces big enough to where I can fit this pattern piece on top of them. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take my pattern piece and I'm going to trace along just the top edge right now, not the bottom, just the top. Once I have that marked on the fabric and I have two layers of the white fabric, I'm gonna pin them together and I'm gonna take them over to the machine and I'm gonna sew directly on that line that I just drew. We're not worrying about the seam allowance. We wanna get this line exactly where those scallops are supposed to start. Once that stitch is in, I'm going to 
trim up just the top side and do nothing to the bottom. But I'm gonna make sure I get all of those corners clipped and I'm gonna go around with my pinking shears along my inverted scallops and cut them out with my pinking shears because that essentially gives all those curves a bunch of little notches. If you don't have pinking shears, you can just cut a bunch of little notches, but those notches or the pinking shears help that curve actually curve when we turn it inside out, which is the next thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna turn all of this inside out, still haven't done anything to the bottom of this. And with that turned inside out, I'm gonna turn all my points and my curves out nicely. I'm gonna stick my crochet hook in there and get all my points. And then I'm gonna take it over to the iron and I'm gonna press the whole thing flat. So now I have a clean edge for the top side of my scallop. So now I can take this piece, place it on top of the blue velvet, pin it in place exactly where it's supposed to go, and then take it over to the machine and top stitch it on. So now the blue velvet has the top side of those scallops, but it still doesn't have the bottom. To get the bottom, we're gonna bag line the whole sleeve including the part that has the white on it. So I'm gonna take my blue piece and I'm gonna grab its lining, which is just a piece of the white cotton. I'm gonna put those right sides together and I'm gonna use my pattern again to mark exactly where the seam goes. So I cut off the seam allowance that was still on my pattern so I could see exactly where the seam goes. And that's important because I'm essentially scalloping twice, right? And if I tried to do this with seam allowance by eye without the exact guide of where that line is supposed to go, I risk having the bottom of the scallops not match the top side which would look really weird and wonky. So I wanna mark it exactly where the seam goes. With that in, I can clip all my corners again, use the pinking shears again, turn everything inside out, and now I have perfect inverted scallop trim on the edge of this sleeve. And I have to do it to the other sleeve and to the blue skirt. So I'm gonna go ahead and do those. And because I'm still not done with detailing, I'm gonna move on to that pink skirt that's supposed to go with the Juban. The pink skirt's really simple. It's just two layers of dull bridal satin and then I marked all of the scallops on the outside. And these are totally straightforward scallops, but they're really small scallops, which makes them a little bit harder to get looking good. You basically have to curve the fabric with your own hands, similarly to how I did the satin stitching on those curves. You gently curve the fabric by pulling on one side and pushing with the other. And when you get to the corners, you need to pivot. And to pivot, you need to put your needle down into the fabric, pick the presser foot back up, and then pivot the whole thing. Come back down and do the other curve. It's not particularly hard, but if you don't have a lot of finesse on the sewing machine yet, your scallops might come out a little blocky. But yeah, with the tiny scallops in, I pinked the edges, I pushed them out again, I pressed them flat again, and then I had to bead the whole thing. So I did that next, and I just did that with bugle beads and some little teardrop beads. But that's all I can do for the pink skirt right now, cause I don't actually know how I want the skirts to go together yet. So I'm gonna avoid that and move on to the snowflake skirt, which has the most detail of any of them. So I went ahead and did the first part of the inverted scallops on this one, which were even more challenging because these ones, for some reason, have an extra little scallop on the top part of the other scallops. I don't know why, but they do. But anyway, I did that. But the next detail that this one needs is each scallop has a snowflake and I'll get to that. But above the snowflake is like a line that ends in a circle. Or the circle part for all of the circles on this costume, because I really did not want to have to try and satin stitch a bunch of tiny circles. I decided to make little, they're not like buttons. So I'm gonna call them bobbles. Made a bunch of these little guys. They're made out of resin and they've got some glitter in them. Uh, I will talk more about resin and like how I made these when we get to the brooches, which might be a different video. Uh, but the one thing I will tell you is the mold I used for these. I grabbed a like coin size mold off of Etsy where the mold already has the two little holes in it. It's actually a mold for like jewelry, for like making earrings and stuff. And it was perfect because that meant that I could make these and not have to drill holes into them to get them onto the costume, which is great because the little holes 
holes mean I can just sew these on by hand. Do have to make like 30 of them though. <laughs> and because there's glitter, it means each one takes two casts per round. So it's gonna take a while, but I have like 10 of them ready already. So they're gonna go on this skirt. Anyway, back to this. That's what that little circle is gonna be, is my little baubles. The line above the circle is once again going to be the white dupe peony attached with heat and bond by ironing it on and then satin stitched around the edges. Uh, I will tell you though, to get my markings for where these go, I did kind of just eyeball it. I put the skirt on my dress form and then I just generally marked where those need to go. So it is very eyeball. But yeah, I'm gonna heat and bond and satin stitch all these little lines on. I'm gonna hand sew on all my little baubles. But once I have all my lines with the little circle on them, then it's time for the snowflakes. Finally, and I say finally, because my snowflakes have been sitting over here on this shelf for like two months. Here they are. Uh, let's go back in time so you can see how I made these. I'm doing all this beading on some stiff felt and I normally use regular felt for applique, but this shape was so complicated. There was no way I could have cut these snowflakes out on regular felt. And the gist of doing a design like this is you wanna go around and do the border first. And my border was these cute little snowflake sequins with two different kinds of pearls. You wanna do the border first cause it gives you a good gauge of where you can place your larger beads. And I'm using these big shiny teardrop flatbacks and then some smaller cat eye flatbacks. And when those are in, that gives me a really good gauge of the space that I still need to fill out, which I just fill out with some little bicones and one more little flat back in the center. I've played around with a couple different ways to do these snowflakes and this was just what was prettiest and easiest. But those are my snowflakes. But yeah, like two months after that was filmed, it's finally time to get those attached and I'm just gonna hand sew them on. What I like about using felt like this is it makes it really easy to hand sew on the costume when you're done with it. Cause you kind of just have to get it on there around the edges and then you can do a whole bunch of whip stitches in the middle to really secure it on. An option for doing applique like this is to do something like use Velcro on the back of the applique and the costume or even using snaps on both of them. And that way you can remove them from the costume and actually wash the costume. I am not concerned about washing this skirt at all because at no point will it be touching my skin. Most of the costume won't even really need to be washed because there are so many under layers. The jubon and the underwear layer are completely washable because remember I surged all those edges. So I don't actually have to worry about washing any of the really complicated parts of this cosplay. Anyway, with the snowflakes sewn on, it's finally time for that lining, which I'm going to do exactly the way I did the other lining with the scallops is I'm going to put the lining over top of it, trace on exactly where that seam line goes, do another stitch to do those scallops, turn everything inside out, press everything flat, and I will have my snowflake skirt. And then the blue skirt on top of that is much simpler. It is the inverted scallops again, which you don't need to see because you've seen me do it like three times now, and the baubles, and those just need to get sewn on. But because I still don't know how I want these skirts to go together, let me tell you about the phenomenon of Snow Miku. So every year since 2010, we've gotten a new Snow Miku. It's basically an annual Miku winter reskin, but when it comes out, new figures come out, specifically Nendoroids. And Nendoroids are these little posable figures and you can like change out what they're holding. You can also change their little faces. They come with lots of different accessories. They're very, they're very cool. I love them very much. I have two links, but I don't have any Miku. So part of it is like a collecting thing, but also every year there's a song that gets released with the Snow Miku. And while the concept of Snow Miku is an official thing, every year since 2020, 12, the design for the Snow Miku has been fan created. Every year there's an art contest where people submit their Snow Miku designs following the theme of that year. What you're seeing right now is 2024's entries. And the theme for next year was a winter feast in Hokkaido. Hokkaido is the northernmost big island of Japan. And the theme usually has to do with Hokkaido because the corporate offices are in Sapporo, Hokkaido. Sap Sapporo? Sapporo? I don't know how to say Sapporo. Is it Sapporo? They're in Hokkaido. <laughs> anyway, the entries are open to the public so anybody can put in their Snow Miku design. Then the entries are narrowed down and then the public votes on which one will become the Snow Miku for that year. This year I voted for the cheese cape and the cheese cape didn't win. The one that won is very pretty though. 
but justice for the cheesecake. Anyway, the first one ever was basically just a reskin of regular Miku, but as the years went on, they got more complicated more iconic, and harder to cosplay. 2023's theme was the ocean inspired by the Hokkaido winter. And obviously I've shown you the winter several times and in several different stages of dress, but it was designed by Isaki TM if I haven't said that 500 times at this point. But I wanted you to know that Isaki's Twitter bio is 2023 Snow Miku's mom. And I just think that's cute. But with her beautiful shades of navy blue to light baby blue that drove me crazy and the warm, cool-toned pink and the craziest hair any Miku has ever had, Isuki perfectly encapsulated the theme and managed to create a Snow Miku that stands out against all of the Snow Mikus in the past and almost every Miku design that there's ever been. Snow Miku being a fan-created thing, I just think is really special. Can you imagine drawing your own version of Miku and then a year later getting to see your art be a hologram and dance on a stage? Like, that is so cool. And Isaki, I hope you're as proud of yourself as we all are of you. Let's finish this thing. This part of the cosplay, which I've been referring to as the actual kimono, I don't actually know how I want to put it together yet because I don't really know how you do a lined kimono, but I went ahead and sewed the velvet panels together just at the shoulders and the back. And this is once again, the same pattern for the Juban. This one, however, doesn't have the collar thing, but what it does have on the collar is a little pink line and some lace or scallops, depending on what reference image you look at. I'm gonna do lace. And I need to get those on before I do the lining for this because I decided to do that little pink line in piping. Piping is really easy to make. The last time I made piping, I did it with a really weird foot that might not have even been a piping foot, but I was watching one of Lady Rebecca's videos and she showed the foot that she used for piping and I actually have one. This is the foot. It looks like a regular sewing foot, but then it has a little groove on the bottom of it. And that little groove is where the piping goes. So I'm gonna pop this on my machine. And the only things you need for piping are a strip of fabric that has been cut on the bias. That is important. The bias is the 45 degree angle of the fabric. Fabric is a bunch of threads woven together, right? And so one way you've got threads going this way and they don't stretch. And the other way you have threads going that way and they don't stretch. But on the bias, you have threads that are crossing, which gives them a little more stretch and wiggle, which you want for piping because it has to go over the other thing you need for piping, which is some kind of rope or cord or yarn. Uh, you can also just buy piping if you don't want to make it. Anyway, I'm gonna take my cord and put it in the middle of my bias strip and then I'm just gonna fold it over like that. And then we can take it over to the machine. We're gonna get it set up in the machine to where the cord is nice and snug under that little groove. And the big thing here is we wanna make sure our needle is in the right spot. But yeah, now that my needle is in the right place, I just have to sew. God, this foot is so much better than the other one I tried to use. Thank you, Lady Rebecca, for your piping insights. All right, so here's my piping. It's whatever, it doesn't look like as nice as the piping you can buy in the store, but it's it's piping. I think I wanna sew the lace onto the piping so that I can sew them both on together. I think I'll still use the piping foot because I want it to be like that, where it's peeking out over the piping. Gonna do another stitch and get that attached. All right, here's how the piping's looking. So at the end, I want the piping in front of the lace. So that's my right side of the piping. So I'm gonna put it right sides together with the velvet and I'm gonna bring it all the way around this collar piece. The next thing I'm gonna do to this piece is attach the lining all the way around the collar. If you're comfortable with piping, you can just go ahead and pin the lining on there and sew all three of these things together at once. But because I am not comfortable with piping, I'm gonna baste the piping on and a basting stitch is just a long straight stitch that's basically just a temporary stitch to hold something onto something so you don't have to sew three things together at once. So I'm gonna do a basting stitch within the seam allowance of the piping and then I'll get my lining out and we'll do the lining part. So that's on there now. So now I'm gonna get my lining and I'm gonna put it right sides together with the velvet and I'm gonna line the whole thing up around the collar. That is all pinned together. So I'm gonna use the piping foot again, I think. The goal is to sew right up next to that piping so that 
the edge becomes the piping, the lace sticking out. You'll see. Okay, so now we have this. What I should should have if I did it right. Oh yeah, look at that. That's what we were looking for. So we've got the piping, the lace, the blue, and then on the inside, the other blue. Let me see how I did on the collar because it was a, it was a little, uh... yeah, I didn't do a super great job on the collar, but you can see the other stitches. I don't know if you can see the other stitches, but I can see the other stitches, but on the straight part, I did pretty good. Oh yeah, okay. It's starting to look like we cosplay. Okay, so we have this part lined, but these are still completely unattached and the sleeve part's unattached, but this is a good start. So now we gotta move on to the sleeves. I'm not actually sure if this will work yet, but I think it will work. But I have my actual sleeve turned right sides out and I have my lining of the same sleeve wrong sides out. So my seam allowance and my raw edges are just out on this one. And what I wanna do now is feed this sleeve to this sleeve. I'm gonna stick it in there to where everything lines up and putting this one in there right sides out inside this one that's wrong sides out means that they are currently right sides together. So now I have this and because I didn't cut this part, I'm gonna go ahead and pin them together around my hand opening because I don't want that to move and I can't like line them up because I didn't cut it yet because I was too scared. I'll cut it off once the stitch is in there and once I know it looks good because I have extra lining fabric, but uh, I beaded these sleeves already so I don't want to mess them up. So for this part, I only need to sew the lining to the actual at the hand hole and at these openings back here. Cause remember this part's supposed to be open. So I'm gonna separate these two layers from these two layers and I'm gonna pin them together. So I have just these two layers pinned together and then I want just these two layers pinned together. I'm gonna take this corner and I'm gonna sew that up with a regular straight stitch, making sure that none of the other side is getting in there. And then I'm gonna take my other side and I'm gonna do the same thing. Sew it up with a straight stitch. But the biggest thing here is I just wanna sew up that opening. I don't wanna actually sew the lining and the actual sleeve together where the sleeve goes into the garment because that needs to stay free for now. If you look at the sleeve, I have a stitch here, a stitch here, and this part where the sleeve attaches is still open. So now I'm gonna go over to the other side here and I'm gonna sew up my hand hole. And because this is in the round, I'm gonna take the cartridge off of my machine so that I can use the free arm so that it can go onto the machine this way, which just makes it easier to sew around it. Yeah, a little unconventional here to not have your edges meeting up, uh, but this, uh, this, this piece of seam allowance is a little extra arbitrary, but everything I do is a little arbitrary. So now that that stitch is actually in there, I will cut this part off. So now that this is like this, I should be able to turn the whole thing right sides out. So if I take this and then how to turn it right side out? That's the question. Okay, I know what I need to do. I need to get this out of here. And then this part. Oh, okay, okay, okay. What? This needs to go inside out. That's that's what it is. This this needs to go inside out. Where's the hole? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. What what is happening here? This should work, maybe? I don't understand. No, that's not right. Maybe if I pull this part out, this one's supposed to be inside out. Is this even possible to have this work? Is my spatial reasoning wrong? I think I f***ed up. I don't think I can do both of those with it turned inside out like that. I can do one of them like that. Or maybe I can get it in there. No, like I, I, cause like this needs to go in here and I can't get it to do that. I have a plan. Instead of unpicking this seam, I'm gonna unpick the top of the sleeve because I can reseam that, but something's gotta get unpicked because this, uh, this didn't work. Will you work now? No, I think I need to unpick the bottom too. <laughs> I don't wanna redo those. Because if I do, if I redo them, I risk ripping or cutting something on the actual sleeve. And I don't want to do that because it's cotton, which means it's delicate. And this is poly cotton, which means it's delicate. delicate.
back. Well, I ripped it anyway. Wow. It's okay. It's on the back. Uh, I'm gonna fix the rip first. This is where we're at. Told you the cotton was delicate. All right. This is why you use a seam ripper. You don't just rip stuff. Now there's a fucking extra seam in there. It's fine. We'll cover it up with rhinestones. It's you know, I had hoped that this would one day be a competition piece, but it's not anymore. But now that that is unpicked, can I? Yeah, I think I can. Okay. What? Why? It looks like I haven't made progress, but I have. No, I haven't. I still gotta unpick it. Okay. I have calmly picked out the handhold seam. And I didn't get any more rips. Uh, so now we're back to this, but this one isn't together. So what I should be able to do now is actually turn this inside out. So if I take this off and flip everything, this is what we wanted to happen before. Now, if I take this and I shove it in here, what I get is this. So now the lining is inside there, right? And we've got are clean openings that go under the arm, right? But then the armhole is still open. I didn't wanna do a top stitch, but I guess I have to. I'm very sad about this rip. I'm trying not to be sad about it. And it is on the back, but it's still just like, of course, I spend all this time working on these sleeves and I up because I'm impatient. I think what I'm gonna do is fold the edges over, get them nice and pressed so they stay folded like that, and then do a very small edge stitch on the very edge of that fold to secure them together. Uh, and that'll be the sleeves. After a perilous journey of me being dumb, we have a sleeve. Still haven't pressed it, so these are gonna look bad right now, but there's a sleeve. The rip is over here, right there. You probably can't even see it, but I know it's there and I'm stupid. So yeah, now I gotta go through all of that again for the other sleeve, but then we can get to how these actually attach to the costume. Today is going to be victory day because we're gonna get these sleeves onto this bodice. So I went ahead and I basted the flutter sleeve to the long sleeve and I did it because I'm going to attach, oh, I did a dumb, I basted all of the layers together, but when what I wanted was to baste all of the layers except for the lining. So now I have to unpick this and do it again. But I need the lining not in there because I want to do something fancy with the lining so that it's clean on the inside, which is not necessary. It's a fancy design and it deserves to be fancily made. Okay, I fixed it. This is what I wanted. So the flutter sleeve and the actual outside of the long sleeve are attached together, but the lining is still free. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna get my bodice and I also wanna get this lining out of the way. And I need to make sure I'm doing <laughs> the right sleeve on the right side. I just wait for my screen saver to show me which side is the sun. This side. This side is the sun. I'm just gonna do this exactly the same way I did it on the Juban. I have everything laid out flat so I can match these up. I'm gonna pin them together. I'm gonna sew them together and make sure that neither pieces of that blue lining are getting into this seam. That stitches in. So now if I flip all this over, we get that. And the lining in here is still a mess cause it's not attached, but we're gonna do that last. Oh, it's starting to look like Snow Miku. Okay. I gotta do the other sleeve and then we can close up the sides and do the lining thing. Okay, I got both sleeves on, but here's the conundrum. There's supposed to be a little opening under the arm. Well, I obviously wanna bag line that because I have the lining, uh, but I don't wanna run into a similar situation that I had with the sleeves where I bag line it and then find out that that is not how physics work. So physics, someone in STEM, please tell me what a uh, scientific concept turning something inside out is. Anyway, uh, so now I'm playing a game called Will It Bag Line? This is the front of the bodice, right? So here's my lace and stuff. Here's the lining. It's inside out. If I line this up and I do a stitch right here, will it bag line? I feel like, and uh, this is the science of physics moving through feelings. 
I feel like if there's a stitch here, I might be able to pull it inside out, but I'm gonna do a really long straight stitch and no back stitches so that if it doesn't work, I can pull it out immediately. Uh, and we're gonna play Will It Bag Line. Okay, let's find out. Will it? Okay, maybe if I just do this. <gasps> it worked! Wow. Okay, that's a win. Okay, that. Okay, so I uh, the I the uh, okay. This time I'm gonna do a regular length stitch with back stitches because we already proved that it can bag line. So now that will just be open and we'll have to secure them at the bottom here, but I gotta do the backs first, so I gotta do that. Okay, the backs might be a little more challenging because they're attached together, but I have faith in myself, so I need to flip this like that so it's inside out, get everything out of the damn way. But how do I pull this part inside out? I don't know if this one will bag line. Bag lining, by the way, is called bag lining because you're essentially, it's not really a bag, right? It's in the shape of a garment, but you end up kind of creating a bag. That's why it's called that. You can also say bagged out. Anyway, I'm gonna see if this, I'm gonna sew these and see if this one works. Moment of truth. Will it bag line? I think it will. I think if I just do this, pull all of this through, fit, fit, go through, and flip all that over. Oh, it bag lined. Oh! We did it, okay. Look at that. Now we get a nice clean edge right there. All right, so then to finish this off, it's a victory lap, this should be easy. Okay, this part needs to close with this part. Here's the front. I'm gonna give this seam allowance a little notch so that it can flip this way. I'm gonna give this seam allowance a little notch so it can flip up. I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna put them together and I'm just gonna sew that up and make sure none of these are in the way. So now, that's where that seam is. Lining is still not closed, but here's what the side looks like. These are not pressed, so they're gonna look a mess. And this lining is still free, so it's gonna be flopping everywhere. But it's closed, and then it's open with a lining, and then it opens up into the sleeve, and the sleeve linings are still not attached. The final step to this, to finish off the lining, I'm just gonna hand sew it. I'm gonna hand sew that bottom part of the lining and hand sew where the shoulder comes together. And then the only thing left will be the bottom still being open. And to finish off the bottom, I'm gonna do it the way I finished off the hand holes on the sleeves. Hey, I haven't done the bottom yet, but I wanted to try it on, so I also put on a little belt. But Wake up, world! We still got a while to go before this is done, but having this piece feels awesome. Okay, fluffy stole thing. The pattern for this is literally just a random shape that I drafted on the dress form. It looks like this. And I have cut this pattern out of one piece of regular cotton and one piece of this fabric that I can only describe as 90s fuzzy sweater material. But this isn't gonna be the actual outside of the fluffy stole. No, this is the part where I show you how much I hate myself. My original plan for all of the fluffy stuff on this cosplay was to hand make hundreds and hundreds of pom-pom balls. And I quickly realized that while I hate myself enough to make this many of them, I did not hate myself enough to make enough for the skirt, but I did make enough for this part, which I think will make this a really pretty and special and fluffy piece. I would really love to one day actually have the patience to cover the entire skirt in handmade pom-pom balls, but I don't have that right now. What I do have is like 50 of them, and I think I have enough to cover it. So basically all I'm gonna do is take my 90s sweater material and put it right sides together with the cotton. I'm gonna sew them right sides together, but I'm only gonna sew them right sides together around the outside, because what that'll let me do is open it up so that I can just sew the pom-pom balls by hand so that then, when all the pom-pom balls are on it, I can flip this back over and hand sew the inside together, which is obviously also going to take a while. This whole thing is gonna take a while. And it also took forever to make these. Do you wanna know how I made these? It's probably exactly what you think. It's the old wrap the yarn around your hand a bunch of times. I found for a really nice fluffy pom-pom, if you wrap it around your hand like 60 times, 
comes out nice and fluffy. The other thing I did, which is not a standard pom-pom thing, is instead of tying off the loops with a piece of yarn, I used zip ties and it worked really well especially for these, for what I'm about to do next. Because to take them from your regular old second grade craft to an actual cute little pom-pom, I had to do the furry thing and brush all the yarn out with a pet brush. And that's what made this take forever. Uh, but yeah, I've already made a bunch. So now I just gotta sew them on to my 90s sweater fabric and then sew up the bottom. And I ended up just hand sewing this onto the blue kimono and then I did two little ties at the bottom where it gets crossed over. But with that done, it's time for the OB that is not a traditional OB at all. So OBs are typically just like really long, very stiffened strips of fabric that get tied around the waist and then they usually have really big ornate bows on the back. There's lots of different kind of bows that they can be tied into and I would have no hope of <laughs> knowing how to tie an OB bow like that. But also most of the time it seems like you need somebody else to do it to you. So I would also have to teach Joe how to tie this very specific Miku bow out of a long strip of stiffened fabric and that's just not gonna happen. The bow on this one is gonna need to be done in the style that I usually do my bows, in the loop bow style that I learned from Cosmic Cotier, which is a Sailor Moon focused cosplay group that has lots of different tutorials. I'll link them in the description, but I make my bows exactly how they do. And that bow on the back is going to have to be a Cosmic Cotier Sailor Moon style bow. The belt part though, I'm so tempted to put boning in it because that is what my corsetry brain says to do, but I'm trying to make it more like an obi, so we're just going with very stiff fabric. But the fabric that I bought to be that specific pink is stretch velvet. One of the worst and most annoying fabrics you can even buy. This velvet is nothing like the blue velvet I've been using. This velvet is slippery. It has no structure to it. It makes a beautiful drape for a cape or a curtain. It's got stretch to it, and it's probably a very bad idea to be using it for a very structured piece, but I'm doing it anyway, because I liked this color. There's a couple things that I needed to do to all of this velvet before I could get started working on the OB. And a lot of that has to do with how many layers are going into the OB. So the backmost layer is a lining of just the auxiliary third pink dupioni that if I didn't mention yet, is leftover fabric from the sake zo I did a couple months ago. Then I've got a structural layer of duck canvas, which is a pretty stiff fabric, but it's not so stiff that it could hold up this OB on its own. So I also have Pelon 808 Craft Fuse fused to that. Pelon 808 Craft Fuse is the interfacing that Cosmic Cotier recommends for bows. And I'm also using it for the OB part. On top of that layer, we've got the actual stretch velvet, which is so slippery and such a bitch that I needed to do a bunch of annoying stuff to get this to hopefully work and look okay. Uh, and that annoying stuff was pad stitching. Pad stitching is usually a historical fashion thing. Whoa, I'm not doing it right. Oh, it essentially comes down to being a technique of flatlining two layers together by hand throughout the piece. Normally you can just flatline stuff by sewing around the edges of it. Well, stretch velvet is so slippery that even if I tried to do that, it would still probably look really bad. So I pad stitched it. So I did huge whip stitches to attach the stretch velvet to the duck cloth layer so that now that I need to sew them together, it might not get all bunched up and weird. But I did that yesterday, so now I have my duck cloth with the interfacing on it, my stretch velvet on this side, and before it gets sewed to the lining, this blue stripe needs to go on it. And I don't know if this is a good idea to do with this particular part, but I have also gone ahead and put a walking foot on my machine. If you're working with any kind of slippery fabric, a walking foot is going to be your friend because it essentially has another pair of feed dogs on the foot itself. And if you don't know what the feed dogs are, they're the little grippy guys that are under the foot that are what move the fabric along. So with a walking foot on, you have grippy guys on the bottom, you have grippy guys on the top, and they both move the fabric along, which helps the velvet not get weird. I don't know if that's a good idea to do on a thing that I'm top stitching. Well, we'll find out. That worked pretty well, actually. Here's that. You can see even now, like, 
some of that velvet is trying to be weird and hopefully it won't be weird. Uh, but the next thing I need to do to this is grab my lining piece, put it right sides together with that and sew it up on the top and bottom. And I'm gonna leave these ends free and hopefully the velvet won't get weird when I do that so that when I turn it right sides out, it looks beautiful. It might not. Lining's on, let's see if it got weird. It needs to be pressed still, but this stretch velvet doesn't look super weird which is a win. Wow. Okay, so the closure for this, I have a lot of explaining to do. The goal I have for the entire costume is that I can put the whole thing on by myself, but I also want a reasonable amount of adjustability. Like I don't wanna just throw a zipper onto this and call it a day. And the idea for this closure came from a couple years ago, a friend of mine, Melanie, we should go follow on Twitch. She has cosplays of both of the stepsisters from Cinderella. And she wanted me to be Anastasia with her one year at Dragon Con. And those dresses are both like professionally made recreations of the Disney park dresses. but the way they close in the back, like a stretchy panel that zips up and then on the stretchy panel already is your laces. So then you just tighten your laces. And so that closure has been living rent free in my mind for years and I've never actually tried to do one. And uh, this is my design. <laughs> it's not super clean. It is what it is, but I think it will function. So basically all I have here is I, this should be pink, but I only bought like one yard of this stretch velvet. And let me tell you, I have used every little scrap of it. Uh, and this was the only scrap I had left. So it just gets a white spandex lining. But this part here is the stretchy part. It is just the stretch velvet with white spandex on the back. They're bagged out. And then they are zigzag stitched to these two lacing panels. And if you don't know how to make a little back closing lacing panel like this, check out my corset video. I show you exactly how to do it. The big thing here is that on one of the lacing panels, I have attached a separating zipper. So this part can go onto one side of the belt and then this part goes on the other side of the belt. So this whole part zips together and it's stretchy so I can do it by myself and then I can just go ahead and have the lacings on there and then I can tighten it myself. What? what? What a concept. I don't know if this will work or look good, but there's a giant bow that goes in the back. So I took the liberty of being a little experimental with this one. And I think all I'm gonna do is put the sides of this right sides together with the edge of the belt, sew them on there, and then install the zipper on the other side. And we'll see if that looks good. But also I need to take out, I still need to take out all of my pad stitching. <laughs> so I need to rip all that out too. So I stitched the zipper down by machine on this side, but then I ended up just hand sewing the back of it. Neither side is super clean or professional, but I don't care. <laughs> this is what we got. I went ahead and put some laces in there. So what I should be able to do. Okay. Well, it is too big. So I need to move my zipper. Okay, take two. I should be able to take this, do up the zipper. That feels like it fits a lot better. And then Aha, that works. And I can probably do that behind my back too. So woo, a piece I can put on by myself that also cinches so that it fits correctly. It's not gonna move and it is adjustable for if my body changes at all. Next time I try this, I'll try to find a way to make it a little cleaner, but I didn't super plan to do it like this. I had no idea how I was gonna close the obi, but I like it. It's cool. Anyway, this needs bows now. And oh boy, are these some bows. So still with the stretch velvet. So I did need to pad stitch these to their structural layers, but these bow loops actually have two different pieces of structure. If you've not seen me do a loop bow before, these bows start like this. Each side of the bow has two pieces like this that get sewn together and then they fold over and they make a loop. So that's half the bow. So on this side, I have the Pelon 808 craft fuse fused to some plain white cotton because I didn't want to fuse it to the stretch velvet. And then the stretch velvet has been pad stitched to that layer of interfacing and cotton. That's my inside layer. And then for my outside layer, I have pad stitched this piece of stretch velvet that's gonna be the outside to a piece of green felt that is left over from the Saki Sew project. What I need to do now is put them right sides together, run a stitch along two sides, leaving what will be the middle of the bow open. And then I can pull those right sides out, press them, fold them into their bow shape. And what is unfortunate is I just realized 
The center of this bow is supposed to be the stretch velvet, but I don't have any more, except for this piece that I just cut off the belt. Uh, so I'm gonna unpick the blue part of this and use this as my bow loop for my back bow. Uh, but yeah, once I have the loops ready, they need to be hand sewn together and then the loop needs to be hand sewn on. Uh, the issue with these bows that I'm having is the tails because I've chosen some really weird fabrics for this. Here's the start of one of the tails, right? The bow tails are supposed to have a sun and a moon on them. And to add to all of my problems, I decided to do that in this really weird reflective gold vinyl. I can kind of press it. I will be able to press the edges, but I can't do my usual heat and bond on the back to attach them. And I did some tests and I think I'm gonna tacky glue the gold stuff onto the stretch velvet and then attach it permanently with a top stitch in yellow thread, not gold thread because gold thread is a bitch and a half. If I'm not happy with how the edges of these look, I'm gonna bead around them. So this might take me a couple days to get these bow tails prepared. And the front bow is basically the same except smaller. The only difference is the tails on the front bow are a little bit of a different shape. Do you see this? This is why stretch velvet is a bitch. I'm gonna have to unpick this and reseam it because I, I didn't pin it, I didn't pad stitch it, I didn't do anything and it just just went completely off where I wanted it to go because it's stretch velvet and if you don't do anything to it, it will f you. I also have like several other bows to make that are all being made exactly the same way so you don't need to see me make all of those but oh my god, more bows. But with the obi made and all the bows on it, it's time to finally once again Play sock god. Kitty has decided that the table is her emotional support table, so she's just gonna be here. But yeah, I don't think you could physically make these socks stay up if you did not play sock god and make them tights. If my giant kitty would move, here's my pattern. I'll throw up the graphic I did last year on how you make a pattern like this for your own leg, but you could really just grab any kind of leggings pattern and split it up. Mine is split up in three pieces this time. Normally what I do is I have the socks come up to a point and then I have the rest of a legging pattern be made out of power mesh. Power mesh is a really sheer, really stretchy fabric. It comes in lots of skin tones and it's a lot easier to work with than trying to just make tights and sew them onto nylons. There's an entire rant in the Kokomi video about that. Don't try to so on nylons, you're just gonna make them run. Anyway, power mesh is relatively easy to work with, but because it's so stretchy, I find that if I make the entire top of the tights power mesh, it ends up being like too stretchy. So this time I've actually cut my pattern into three pieces. Please move. So we've got this part. This is the actual sock. This part here in the middle is gonna be the power mesh part. And I'm not actually cutting the scallops into this. I'm actually gonna cut it longer. Uh, and then at the top, I'm doing another panel of my regular stretch fabric that's not power mesh so that it's sort of like a booty short at the top. The other thing is I usually do my socks in spandex, but I've also found that I don't really like the way spandex feels. Like it kind of feels gross on your skin. I don't know. So this time I went with a cotton jersey. So it's got stretch to it. It's not four-way stretch. So four-way stretch means it can stretch this way and that way. Spandex can do that. This one only stretches one way. And if you have a fabric that only stretches one way, make sure you cut it where the stretch is going around your body or you have completely defeated the purpose of using a stretch fabric. So now I have to do scallops on a stretch fabric. How do you do that? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, when you work with stretch fabric, you can't use a regular straight stitch because when that fabric stretches, the straight stitch is gonna snap. There are a couple stitches you can use though. You can use a zigzag stitch or a lightning stitch, and a lightning stitch is sometimes called a stretch stitch. Some machines will have specific stretch stitches that are so small that they mimic the look of a straight stitch. On my non-computerized machine, my crafter, I have a regular zigzag stitch and a lightning stitch, and I actually just decided to go with the regular zigzag stitch to do the actual scallop part. Doing the scallops works pretty much the same as doing any other scallops. Because these are leggings, I can't line the entire sock. That would be really weird and probably lead to bunching. You, ju you just generally don't line stretch fabrics. And funnily enough, the first time I ever played Sock God, I basically made these exact tights. Cause the first time I ever played Sock God was for Godoka, who has scalloped 
socks. And I was like, how did I do this? How did I do scallops? And then also get them onto the panel. I, I am lucky that these never really snapped off because what I ended up doing, it looks like, is I, it looks like I just did a regular straight stitch to do the scallops. I know I did a facing for the scallops and a facing is a small piece of lining at the edge of a garment. So it's not a lining that goes all the way through the sock. It's a lining that's just at the edge. And then I just top stitched the power mesh under the scallops. Anyway, to make my scallops, I'm gonna take my facing piece. I'm gonna put it right sides together with the top of my sock. And then I'm gonna grab my pattern and I'm gonna trace the scallops onto the facing piece. Then I'm gonna go over to the machine and making sure I have a ballpoint needle on the machine. You need a ballpoint needle for stretch because stretch fabrics have like elasticy stuff in them. And if you have a sharp needle, the needle can catch onto those sharp threads and like pull them through. And that messes up with the way the bobbin winds around the other thread. So you end up skipping stitches. Your machine might just stop stitching entirely, but a ballpoint needle has like a rounded point. So it goes around those stretchy fibers instead of piercing through them. I am gonna use a regular zigzag stitch to do this, but I'm gonna make it really narrow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the machine to zigzag stitch and then I'm gonna lower my stitch width down pretty far. And then you wanna have a relatively normal, if not a little bit low stitch length so that the stitches are tight enough that you get a nice curve. And then you just do the scallops like you would normally, just following the line that you already put in there. With that stitch in, I'm gonna flip everything back over. I'm gonna get it nice and pressed so that it looks good. It's a little hard to get stretch scallops to look good for obvious reasons, but if you give them a good press, you'll have a little more hope. But when those scallops are done, I'm gonna take my power mesh piece, I'm gonna put it just under it. We're putting it just on top of it. There's no right sides to the other. I guess it's wrong side to right side and I'm gonna top stitch them in, but I'm not gonna top stitch them with a straight stitch. I'm actually gonna go over to my Foff because it's a quilting machine and it just does stuff like this a little more accurately than a non-computerized machine. And I'm gonna use its stretch stitch because it's so tiny and so perfect that it looks almost identical to a regular straight stitch. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did with my Garuka tights to these. I'm gonna trim down the facing and the power mesh to be like a half inch away from the scallops. I'm gonna do it with my pinking shears too. And that isn't to keep it from fraying because neither of these fabrics really fray. A lot of stretch fabrics just don't fray. The reason I'm doing it with the pinking shears is because when it's pinked like that, it sort of helps blend that edge into looking like, I don't know, more natural instead of seeing like a super hard edge. It kind of feathers it a little bit. Here's how they look on the front. So now I just got to put this guy right sides together with that guy. Sew that up with a zigzag stitch and we'll be ready to put them together. And how do they go together? You put your crotch seam in and you stop before the leg. You put your butt seam in and you also stop before you get to the leg. You make it go spread eagle and now you actually sew up the leg and you turn it right sides out and add a waistband. Anyway, those are my tights. Let's move on to the bonnet. I love bonnets, but this one has like 500 colors and 600 scallops. I patterned this and cut the pieces out for it like a month ago. So yesterday I grabbed all the pieces I cut and I was just like, how did I want to do this? But luckily I wrote myself notes on my own pattern. Here's the pattern. I've got myself a guide for the back and then I have all these little pieces cut out. And what I needed to do was cut two pieces per each of these little pieces of their corresponding fabric. Go ahead and get their scallops in there, turn them inside out and press them flat. And you already know how I do scallops. So what I have ready is a bunch of little already scalloped bits in those patterns. Got my little sun piece, pink scallop piece, blue scallop piece, two pieces of the dark blue, like the pattern says. And then I have my insidey part, which is another one of those annoying pieces that has little scallops too, uh, which came out kind of terrible. And it honestly just looks like a ditto. But yeah, that's my inside layer. So all I need to do now is pick one of my blue sides, say, okay, that's the front. Get the pink one that goes on the front, put that on there and then top stitch that onto this blue piece. And I need to take the other one. This one's the back now. And I need to get all of these little pieces lined up onto that and top stitch all of those on there. When I have these top stitched onto this piece, what I can do is take both of them, put them right sides together, 
do the scallops around the top of the blue pieces, turn that right sides out, and then cut this pattern out of interfacing. This is the full size of the bonnet. And I'm just gonna shove the interfacing in there. And here's my finished bonnet. I ended up doing bias tape on the bottom here. Did a machine stitch on this side, flipped it over, did a hand stitch here, hand stitched the ruffle on, and then on my bias tape, I've got two little parachute clips and I have the corresponding parachute clips and these will need to be sewn onto the wig somewhere. I don't know where on the wig yet, but let me show you it on me. Wow, bonnet, it's super cute. I haven't gotten to see the back yet, but you can see it. Uh, but now that this is done, I have to tackle the thing I have been avoiding this entire time. A thing I hate making so much and wearing so much that oftentimes when a character has them, I just don't do them. It's time to finally make the gloves. I have to preface this by saying, I am not the person you should listen to when it comes to gloves. I have made all of one pair of gloves, meaning I have made two gloves, and they didn't come out very good. This is not a tutorial on gloves. This is you watching me suffer. So, these are the gloves. My first test was to see if I could do them in the upholstery velvet that the rest of the blue of the cosplay is made of, and uh, it didn't go well. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, they look bad, they feel bad, and I d did not get the pattern right at all. So the last time I made gloves and to make this one, I used a free glove pattern that I found online, which funnily enough, when I finally read the lore behind it, I love that the person that made this easy to understand glove pattern gave up on using it themselves. And I tried to watch a couple videos on how you pattern your own glove and they were so boring and so many numbers that I wrapped my freaking hand in tape. I put on a nitrate glove and I wrapped my hand in tape and I got my own glove pattern. Now it's not like a actual glove pattern should be in any sense, but I did also cut gussets because I want gussets. They do make the glove fit better. The other thing is with a non-stretch fabric, you really end up with gloves that just look like leather gloves. And no matter what you do with leather gloves, they just look like serial killer gloves. And I'm trying to get my hands to look like Snow Miku Johnny Weir moment and not Wendigoon's eventual serial killer arc moment. So I'm also not going to use the upholstery velvet at all. And I called a Hail Mary and I ordered some stretch velvet. Yes, I'm using a stretch fabric now, but I'm still gonna use gussets because they still make the glove fit better. Will these fit perfectly? I don't know, but I already started one of them and it's still not great. But let me tell you, it feels like it's gonna fit. And this is once again, the science of physics through feelings. If you have ever seen an actual glove pattern before, you're probably like, what? is that, Sarah? Here's the front and the back. Here's the gussets. The gussets look normal, at least. And here's the thumb. The thumb looks pretty dang weird, but I already cut them out of my stretch velvet. So if you have no idea what a gusset is, I'll show you on this one that's already like half done. So the gusset is the part that goes in between your fingers. These, when they're on gloves, they go by a couple names. In fact, uh, in my fork video, I was told that they are actually called forks, but I feel like gusset makes more literal sense. A gusset is like a little piece of a pattern that helps you go around a curve. And that's what this is doing. It's going around the curve of your fingers. So each one starts at the tip of a finger, goes through the crotch of your finger and then goes to the other side of the other finger. And what I usually do is I go through and I will sew my gussets in between each finger and do all three of them on one side and then I'll close it up and then I'll do all three gussets on the other side. So what you end up with is fingies. Uh, the issue is sewing teeny tiny little pieces like this is really difficult, which is why uh, it is advantageous to hand sew gloves. I don't find that sewing gussets on by machine is that hard. What I find really hard is getting the tips of the fingers right. I don't know how to do that by machine. And I also find the thumb really hard to do by machine. Okay. So this is what it looks like when the gussets are on one side. So each one is going in between each of the fingers and then this side doesn't have any gussets yet. So now what I do is this stuff all comes back over and 
you can kind of see where I'm going with this in that now this edge gets connected to this gusset. This finger gets sewn to this gusset on this side. So I'm gonna get everything out of the way and sew that up on there. And then once that's on there, you do it to the other side so you end up with a full finger. It's just a matter of pushing everything else out of the way so that I can feed this through the machine and not catch any of those other layers. I once had a friend who wanted to get into competing when she was asking what she needed to make for the cosplay. In a panic, she was just like, do I need to make my own gloves? The short answer is no, but the longer answer is that gloves are one of the hardest things to sew and they're one of the easiest things to mess up. And one of the biggest things with competing is how do you stand out amongst all of these other amazing cosplays? And if you walk into a judging room with really well-made, impeccably patterned and tailored gloves, not these, not these gloves, but if you walk into a judging room with an impeccable pair of gusseted leather gloves, Oh, you're getting something. You still have to do it well though, that's the problem. I don't see myself competing in Snow Miku anytime soon, cause like I'm skipping Winter Cosplay, is it Winter Cosplay Champion? Yeah, it's Winter Cosplay Championship now. It used to be Crown. I didn't want to do that this year cause I won a title last year. <laughs> and I'm kind of a believer in like, you gotta like take a little break, you know, let, let other people shine and like, I would, I would consider like competing 2024 at Hall Mat. Let some other people have their moment in the sun, not take up that spot. And I'm also not saying that as like, oh, I would definitely win. No, it's more so like only so many people get into winter cosplay championship. So me not applying is another person that could get in. I'm not cocky enough to say I would get in and win. I am cocky enough to say I would get in. Last gusset's giving me trouble. Okay, fam, come on, come on, get out of the way. Need this to go this way. Holy moly. Now I gotta sew up this other side down to this fingy, and I will be done with these fucking gussets. Hey, hey! Will my fingers fit in here? They do! To finish these up, I am just going to hand sew on my thumb and hand sew the tops of these fingers to make them actually fit my fingers. Some of them are too long. All right, these are done. They are um, bad. Uh, this thumb came out okay. This thumb I did by hand. This thumb, this thumb I did on the machine and I kind of got the placement wrong. I've kind of got a bump and I don't, Feel like unpicking that and doing it again. So we're going with these. They're close enough to what they're supposed to be. And you know what? They're on my body and that is fine. Funnily enough, this marks the end of creating the actual cosplay part. Not the wig. The wig isn't over yet. Not the prop. The prop isn't over yet. And those will be other videos. But these were the last piece of the cosplay. Serendipity kind of struck here in that right when I finished these, there was a knock at the door and at the door was my birthday present from Joe. Yes, my birthday was in July and it didn't come until November. It's November now, by the way, uh, but this was my birthday present from Joe. I asked for her, so I knew she was coming but I've waited several months for her to come. And now she's here and she's so perfect and cute and would have been a great thing to have as a reference for making the cosplay, but she only came to see me when she knew I was ready. But now comes the most important part and most boring part and most frustrating part of making any cosplay, troubleshooting. And by that, I mean, I need to put the entire thing on and make sure it all works together and doesn't fall off my body. And what better way to stress test the cosplay than to do a dance test?
Uh, one thing that the dance test taught me was that my tights don't fit. <laughs> they are too small and they ripped and my bloomers were too big and would not stop falling down. But other than that, you know what? It feels special. And this is the science of feeling moving through feelings now. But I do think I got that one little ounce of special, important energy I was looking for. And I absolutely cannot wait to see this with the wig on. But you'll have to tune in next week to see that, or if you're in the future, you get to see it now. Well, that's how I did all the garments, but if you wanna see the absolute odyssey that was making the wig for this, make sure you're subscribed or click somewhere because if you're in the future, it's already here. But thank you so much for watching my very long video. If you wanna support the channel directly, you can check out my Patreon where you'll get some exclusive content, including my makeup tests for this cosplay and some stuff that got cut out of this video. Uh, I also have merch. There's merch in the description if you want some cute merch. But if you are just watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sending the video to a friend or your mom, or definitely, please subscribe, then you are supporting the channel too. So thank you. And if you got all the way to the end, please tell me what you think of my blue hair. I want more blue. I was too chicken to do all blue, but I want more blue, uh, but I really like it. But tell me what you think. Anyway, I think the wig video will be out in a week and then the brush will be out a week after that. And then you'll get a special video at the end of December. Hopefully I'll finish it by the end of December of the vlog of me going to go dance in the whole cosplay. So please stick around for that and please subscribe. And I never get to say this, but I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you to the patrons, Wolfus Cosplay, Joey, Ashing Lee, Himawari Gumi Cosplay, Punk Shepherd Fursuits, Moss Boss, Magical Girl Melanie, Honey Crisp Cos, Lilith, Sydney, Kiera, Underlock V, Cyrus, aka Yoitz 8 Bit, Neki, Boy Toy Name Noise, Willow Redwood, Bunny, Clown Supreme, Gumdrop Cos, Bunny, Azure Kate, Joey, White Rabbit Cosplay, Hachi, Sweet Spectre, Still Beating Heart of Jeff Gordon, Nicole, Moss the Demon Dude, Donna, A Bit of Cake, Shay, Mac, Ethan, Maple Fran Cakes, Red Rover Dose, Peste at Cholera, Darian, Gassy Peepers, Tiny Wyvern, Polite Crow asking if you might kindly open the bins for a little rummage, Bee Man, Elias Locke, Lot of Bees, Terror Bear, Ray Zach, Sophie, He May Dairy Cosplay, Cookie, Honeybean, Brittany, Lena, Butter, Shelly, Lay, Corden, Nora, Lollipop, Jester, Tootie, Fruity, Kelly, Spooky Kitsune Cosplay, Luxtrous Cosplay, Jennifer, Abby, Lily, Lunar Lepus Cosplay, Crodelia, No Roman, LOL, Katie, Amai, Jelly, Lady Blue Cosplay, Hania, Fake Smiley 7, Sebastian, Amar, Simrel, Matcha Kit Kat, Walter, Stephanie, Joda, Coconut, Night Wolf, Bingus Owl, Alora Polaris Cosplay, Aaron, Tomaki Potato, Gabby Bear, Jesse Chu, Sarah, Another Zip Tie, Hazel, Alec, Lady Senshi, Ramboulin Cosplay, Jenna, Kazmira, Rory, Astro Fox, Kimberly, Tam Tam the Tailor, Legfish, Amanda, Connie, Paul, GT Cosplay, Zihibi, Cal, Sansuffle, Flair, Rhine Like Wine, Alyssa, Queen Platypus, Foxy McLoxy, Taylor, Tessa Bow, Shell, Alyssa, Melissa, Akiba Aki, Chibi Lease, Rainbow Lola, Gloom Shroom, Infinite Salad, Sephestra, Kelly, Hubasta, Mag, Magda, Chai, Alba and Brent, Sleepy Ellie, Audrey, Benjamin, Spacey Stitches, Coco Yumi, Skasa, Ariana, Articus the Tiger Wolf, Minor, Food Penguin, Alyssa, Katie, Toby, Shellman, Alice, Rebecca, Slush Puff, aka Corn Copy, Samantha, Adriana, Kim, Saigni Cosplay, Kaimatsu, Block Kitty DJ, Meredith, Sarah, Cowbones, Lunar, Lula Rush Cosplay, Marcy, So Into Music, Julian, Cam, Zen, Andrew, Pin, Snip, and Clar. Bountiful. Why did I do this to myself? Ooh.